Okay, everybody. Uh, so I am Don. I'm the, I guess, the originator of the F# -sharp language and now an F# -sharp community contributor. I work at uh, Microsoft and I do about half my time working on F# -sharp tooling and uh, the compiler, the language design, uh, and uh, you know, sort of evolving the F# -sharp language. And about the other half of my time, I work on uh, AI tooling and programmability, uh, also using F# -sharp and uh, I've just actually just got off a call with the machine learning community for .NET, uh, which is a um, community call that was done just about an hour ago, and so that's been very enjoyable. This, however, is the F# -sharp, uh, community um, session for specialising in topics around the compiler, and this is Vlad and myself uh, have been having these uh, conversations. Some of them initially between ourselves, just looking at parts of the compiler, and I also do the same thing with Will, who's uh, doing amazing work on the compiler as well. Uh, we can talk about that. Uh, in fact, maybe Will would like to have uh, do a couple of these sessions in a little bit. I'll mention more about that in a moment. Um, and so this is a sort of deep dive into the compiler from the point of view of people who might want to contribute either to the compiler, to the RFCs about the F-sharp language, or to um, uh, to the libraries or also people who are technically minded, people who want to use the features as well. Uh, so just to say some of the work uh, that Will has been doing has been fantastic. He's actually been doing model compiler implementations of taking the lessons from compilers like the Rosalind C Sharp compiler and thinking about how to uh, take out the techniques that are used in those compilers and use them in the context of the F# -sharp compiler, or and and has been doing some model implementations of that as well. Uh, right uh, point of view from the compiler and the language service for supporting editing as well, uh, and uh, all the all the way through the stack. Now uh, today's topic, and I will share my screen now. Sorry, my camera is not working. Uh, I have just an ongoing technical issue with this webcam, which I really just have to get rid of it and get a new one. So I will, I will try and do that soon. So F# -sharp compiler community sessions. And our topic is tasks and resumable state machines. Now this is slightly unusual, and we're actually talking about an upcoming feature of probably F# -sharp 6.0, and we don't normally do uh, we, we so far in the sessions we've focused on existing functionality within the compiler and this one is actually talking about future functionality uh, and uh, uh, so it's a little bit different now we will be doing a separate design review with the community on this feature and this is not so much a design review but inevitably it probably will be a little bit like that but it's not an official, uh, you could say, design review. As part of the process for doing RFCs for the F# -sharp language, we've we've decided, or we've you know, we found it very very useful to do two things. First of all, a design review talking session, and also one where we look at the feature with regard to implementation and testing of that feature. And for the features we shipped in F# -sharp 5.0, this was just incredibly useful process. Uh, there was uh, we, we 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 shipped a feature called Open Type, for example. Um, so let's take a look. I think these RFCs for 5.0 are not yet in a separate directory, so we have to remember which ones we actually just shipped. Uh, we shipped da 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 da. Uh, where are they? They should be here somewhere. Oh, no, they're in the preview directory. Yeah, preview here. Uh, so I, I did a design review with Will and Vlad and uh, Philip and, and others on uh, the name of feature, and that actually flushed out quite a few sort of niggling problems with that feature and uh, things to do with IntelliSense as well, autocomplete. And uh, oh, we've got two RFCs for name of. Oh no, one's name of pattern. Yes, so we did both of those. And separately, uh, Will did a design review on open type declaration, uh, which led to quite a few refinements of the design for that. Interactions with other features that we hadn't thought about, and really became the whole design became a lot better because of what was done in that. <clears throat> so let's talk about. 
tasks, which is actually um, task resumable code and task builder resumable tasks and resumable state machines. Okay. So I'll open up a gist like I often do, just to kind of free talk on this. This isn't a prepared presentation. This is just us having a chat about it. And Vlad will stop and ask me things along the way and also take your questions and interrupt me with those. So uh, many of you will know, uh, there's actually a, a uh, this got tweeted around uh, by Miguel de Casa recently. Uh, so F Sharp has async programming. So, uh, and what's the history of this? So in F sharp, we have async of T and in C sharp uh, 4.0, actually .NET, this is C sharp slash, I've forgotten the exact versions for the language, but this is .NET, I think 4.0, added a thing called task of T, okay? And they're somewhat similar, they're both, um, but what's the history of this? This was F Sharp did this sort of async thing back in around 2007. If you want to read this, go to fsharp.org slash history. Org slash history, yeah. And you will see in the paper, the early history of the F Sharp language, you will actually see a section on async programming. Uh, we've got a bit of echo on the call from someone. I'm sure who. So you can see in section 9.7, F sharp uh, 1.0 talks about improving the functional core async await. Okay, so and that in that in, in in that feature we added the type async of t, and we added the async dot 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 construct, and uh, and then constructs for using those like async dot parallel, uh, async dot run synchronously. Uh, and the like. And so we call this feature roughly language integrated integrated async. And the essence of the feature is to take code and turn it into, and then you kind of put async around that code, roughly speaking. And that becomes, uh, so you have code returning type T of some kind. So maybe code returning an int and then you get async of the same code and that roughly returns an async of int and more or less it gives it sort of rewrites this code using a feature called computation expressions and gives you a asynchronous version of that code where this code might have await points in it so you can have let bang x equal dot 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 and this bang and then you have some more code and this bang indicates a point where the rest of the code so if we have some expression on the right here, and then we have the rest of some code, then everything in here, the, everything from this and this part here, first of all, the expression gets evaluated and then the then the code gets resumed through at this point here. Okay. And the type given to that is async of T. And we use async of T for, for a bunch of reasons. So one is we wanted explicit uh, starting of async. Okay. So we didn't, when you do this async, it doesn't just start immediately. It doesn't just run the expression. It just gives you an async of T, which you have to actually explicitly run. So explicit, uh, and you can ex compose those things. So if I have some code one, so sort of job one equals async, blah, blah, blah. And I have job two, I do async blah, 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 blah. Then you uh, explicitly compose those and explicitly start uh, async. There's also, um, it propagates cancellation tokens implicitly. So that means when you, um, so for instance, so it propagates. And that means when you do async dot parallel on job one and job two, uh, you do and you do async dot uh, start. Well, if you want, you can give a cancellation token. So if you can actually say let this equal. It's, it's a composition of that equal that, and you can start C with with a cancellation token of some kind. 
and then you can that thing is running and you can do async dot cancel okay so that that's how the async feature works okay so you're probably familiar with that and you're probably familiar with how tasks work they're a little bit different uh in um uh they the, the names of everything is a little bit different that you don't explicitly start a task it just starts as soon as you kind of create it and it runs until its first asynchronous await point uh th that uh, with the the first point for instance where it does asynchronous io and in c sharp uh they of course do a similar thing to async up here in that they convert code uh to run in a in a way that it can it's resumable code okay so uh, the, the problem we have the problems with F sharp async is really nice. It does a lot of nice things. It also, uh, but the problem is it is slower, and it's slower partly because of an extra layer of wrapping and allocations to do with this. So there's several reasons. One is allocations. Two is it's uh, so allocations of of wrappers uh, before running. The next one is allocation of continuation functions. Okay. So when you have an async like I have before with a let bang, let bang x equal some expression, and then you have some more code, then this part, everything but the expression, this part and the and the and the and the body here becomes a continuation function. So you can roughly think of this becomes uh expression uh so async dot um dot bind roughly speaking so uh of uh the expression and then a function x going to the body okay so this is a function object and it gets allocated and gets stored away waiting for the completion of the asynchronous computation and then it gets executed and so this allocation of this continuation function is one of the reasons why async is slower so uh so while while loops for loops uh, uh get um uh, so uh, this is async while loops async for loops get a uh, uh compiled Compiled to combinators, what we call a combinator. Combinators, combinators. Combinators is a funny old old term. It's not used very much, uh, but what I mean is it's roughly async dot while. Uh, and you'll have so if you have, let's do this. So you have an async while loop of some kind. We have while guard expression do body expression. This will be compiled into a couple of closures. One is to repeatedly evaluate the guard expression when needed, and the other one is to repeatedly give the body expression. But the, the body expression is actually an async computation. It's been translated already, so it's going to be like the body, the translation of body expression into async form. And so this is now this sort of thing, async dot while. It's actually lower, uh, uh, lower, because lower, it's this async thing out the front. But this is going to be a more expensive representation of a while loop than you might have for normal synchronous code. So, uh, and um, so minimum one alloc, uh, minimum several allocations for each tar each async. And that's kind of related to this thing here. And actually, it's not just while loops and and for loops. It's not even just async one. But if you actually, it's any while loop and any for loop, even if it doesn't have a let bang. I mean, it's in an async. You'll probably have a let bang in the middle. But actually, any while loop and any for loop get this get this kind of treatment like this. And so that does add, start to add up. And now it's not it's not just that it's also sequencing of things if you do and this has to be uh, if you do a sequencing I'll do it again like um, 
is Stubang uh, expression one or oh, computation one. one. That's an asynchronous computation. Uh, so and, and then do bang computation two. Let's so say those are functions. Then this will be something like async.combine. And it will be uh, the first the the first computation. Then it will get the res uh, it'll sort of do the next computation like this. It's a very similar a similar thing, uh, typical of functional programming for control structures. And again, closure time here, and you kind of think, okay, but well, these things start to add up. Now it doesn't really matter for most purposes. F sharp async is actually totally fine for very very many purposes, uh, and. Uh, the fact it uh, it does these nice things with cancellation tokens, propagates cancellation tokens implicitly. It actually checks can cancellation uh, uh, implicitly. So that means all your async code becomes cancelable because it's automatically inserting uh, checks here and here for for cancellation. It's as if the compiler had rewritten this with if. If the can the current cancellation token, it would, it would be something look like this. Well, I won't actually write it out, but it's here putting an insert, inserting a check here. Okay, that's all fine. But it does. Then you start to think, well, what should what should this code actually be? What should we really get for this async code? And then you can look across to what C sharp does for its async feature, and you realize, ah, uh, actually, dot net dot it has some nice facilities for generating better code for this sort of thing. So let's take the same constructs here. Let's copy these down. And we'll talk about uh, what you get with the F sharp library called taskbuilder.fs. If you go look up taskbuilder.fs and you can use it today, and it's effectively almost exactly the same semantics that we want for tasks in F sharp. And what, one approach to this might be say, look, let's just make async run faster. Let's do better code generation for these constructs so that they don't do this sort of thing. And that would be good in the long term. But the problem is because of this sort of thing, this allocation of these wrappers before running, and this minim yeah, minimum of several allocations as a result, we could actually never get async to run as fast in the limit we can't get it to run as fast as task. It in inevitably does that extra allocation or two. And, um, you know, it's it's not a very, it, it would be nice to do that to async, but the async also has another problem that it doesn't interoperate. To, to do interoperate with tasks, you have to do a bit of work. That is, you have to do things like, uh, as you, many of you know, you might have to do let bang result, Result equal async dot await task, sort of task dot sleep or something. If you're going to do, there's an async dot sleep, but let's say we're generating this task. And, but of course, you want to pass in the cancellation token, so we'll call that CT. And where do you get the cancellation token from? Well, it's sort of what I was going to write before. We have to do CT equal async dot ca uh, cancellation token, I think it is. This gets the current cancellation token. And this uh, awaits the task using that thing. And this is a fine; it works. It's, um, but it's a fair bit of ceremony to get from a to, to use a task inside an async. So the although we can make async run faster, and I really hope to one day, because I think the programming model is better than tasks in many ways. Our first job is to give proper support for tasks. And for, for, fortunately, we kind of thought ahead and we know that async is not the only control construct construct in the world and we have this general feature called computation expressions in f sharp which allow us to uh, have a task builder like this and we can do two of those and i guess we'll call them task t1 and t2 and uh and we'll have a task and the other code will look the same now it's going to have slightly different semantics in that as soon as you go kind of do let t3 equal this thing then this expression is going to start running 
and uh, it, and then it's going to give you back a task which represents the continuation at the first at the first asynchronous binding point. It doesn't necessarily mean it's this binding point. If this thing doesn't complete asynchronously, if it's some asynchronous thing, then it might be further down, uh, down, down, down the chain. So if it, if it completes synchronously, the code will continue and run synchronously. Um, right. Uh, okay. So, so what does task builder do? Well, task builder actually does the same sort of thing. Task dot bind with continuations. I'll bring up the code for task builder. It's here it is. And it's a nougat for it. It's very stable. It's got good benchmarks and the like. And so you can see the kind of code we have here, all very good. Uh, and they say, here's the F-sharp method and here's the exact corresponding C-sharp that it should correspond to semantically. Uh, and they say, there's a small performance hit that's fine. It should be uh, faster than using um, the, 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 the other ways of building tasks. OK, and let's look at uh, task builder. Uh, it's here. And what does it actually do? Well, it defines a task builder. And it's got some representation of tasks under hood, uh, uh, ways of generating tasks, which we will skip over and it's got quite a lot of use of this uh oh hang on, we'll get back to that in a moment so we'll just look at the actual builder constructs so here, here are the the methods task builder and the task builder v2 but the the main thing is that it offers things like bind which takes a task and a continuation there and it sort of does more aggressive inlining than the F sharp uh, async does. So, or use async does it quite a lot now, but uh, it, it, it inlines quite a lot of things and that's all good for performance generally. And then it um, does bind task and so on. A oh, good, good. And while loops and try with and try finally and everything you need. And if we look inside the tests for the kind of programming where you can do, so you can use do this today in F sharp. It's not, uh, you can go and write this task code and task codes doing mutation and so on, and all the way down, down, down the line, it tests all the different things. And you'll see that interop is much nicer. You can just do do task.yield. These are just proper.net tasks and everything is good. Right, so that that's the, that's where we're at uh, now. The the problem is it's still this task builder thing is still using these continuations, and they, so you've still got the allocations from the continuations. And you say, well, what is the code we should actually generate? If I have a, a function that does something like this, okay, get rid of this does. Then what? Uh, what's the actual .NET code we should generate that for there? And uh, I, in a way, what is the sort of .NET IL? Now I'm not actually going to write .NET IL because that's not an easy thing to do. But roughly speaking, you'll get a method with a with a function here, and it will lay down what we really want is it to lay down the code for the computation, and lay down the code for the next computation here. And it's it's kind of going to have a uh, it's going to be resumable code. So this code is going to sit inside a state machine of some kind. Okay, it's a type, roughly speaking. We'll call it a type, even though this isn't .NET IL syntax. So I'll just put dot in just to make it look like it is. Uh, and we have will have a method, and it will also this type thing will also have a field. Build. And so this method will be called move next. Like this. And roughly speaking, that code that we had before, let f here, will become a dot method f, which uh, creates an instance of state machine, and let's say m equals state machine, like that. And then we'll do sm dot move next on that thing. And it will, and the state machine will have a field, and it will be roughly be an integer, and I'll call it a program counter. 
and the program counter will be initially initialized to zero. And then at the top of the method, it will have a uh, switch on the program counter. And this will be, um, this is on this object or this here, switch on this dot program counter. And roughly speaking, if it's a zero, uh, okay, zero, we will want to do computation one. Uh, and if it's a case one, and then after we, well, what is now? The thing is, computation one is going to have to tell us whether it completed synchronously or asynchronously. So we'll, we'll have a, we'll roughly speaking, have a, I use let, let sync uh, equal. Uh, so, so did complete. Okay, for computation one. And uh, if it did complete, complete. Uh, then, uh, well, we've got several choices here. One is you could go this.pc gets uh, one, and then we go uh, jump to top, okay? And you, put, you lay down a label here, which is, uh, you say go to, jump to, which is, and then you actually have go to top. Uh, uh, or, uh, and if it didn't, then return uh, false, because these things, these move next functions, here, so this is going to be whatever the async computation here. So this is actually probably going to be dot move next or something on this thing. Uh, and this thing here, actually, it's going to be something like let equal this. Uh, the, uh, I just like something like this. Uh, and these things are all going to return booleans about whether they completed or not, whether they did the move or not. Okay, uh, and there will be a case one, which will have the other computation, and it will be computation two. Now, often in this kind of thing, there's even though uh, no, this is this is this is right. Uh, so then this will go to, if it completed, then it go to case two. And case two is just return true because finally we've completed. Uh, actually, in this kind of setting, you can just go to case two, label two here, and you would put in put in a label two here, and you would put in a label one here, and you would go to label one one and we won't ever go to top okay and this is roughly what you would like this thing this task to come become and this thing might inherit from task.t task roughly speaking uh now there's a few um there's a few quirks here. So the method now creates a state machine and moves it. Now, actually, um, that's an allocation, which means that any of your task curlies have to have at least one allocation. And it turns out that, yeah, the C-sharp compiler does some really, and tasks, the overall task implementation, it's some really cunning things to even avoid that allocation. So what it does is the the actual code for all this, at least uh, here, gets put into a struct. So this is actually this uh, roughly speaking, this state machine thing is actually a struct here. Yeah, okay, uh, but the problem is, what happens to that struct if the thing uh did not complete and you return false okay so um so in that case the struct has to be cop the contents of the struct have to be saved away as part of saving the state of the state machine uh and that that is looked after through a slightly more complex infrastructure and you can look at it in the task builder code here uh, and it, it is oops, not test program. We are in task builder and task builder.fs. 
And this thing is to do with this step state machine. We'll actually see it in this I async state machine. So you can have your struct type implement this I async state machine. And it has this set state machine, which kind of saves away the state of the state machine, which is a struct and kind of reinstates it again. It kind of puts it back and, and forth as it gets reactivated for the hosting of the task. So, but the upshot is, is that if you're, code if you're synchronous if your code here these computations if both of these re return synchronously so completed completed and you run through the state machine and you go to through here did complete go to label one run computation two go to label two return true everything synchronously then you still you get absolutely no allocations all the way through you get some structs created uh, for state machines probably there'll be one struct instance here one struct instance here and, and another struct instance here but it's all stack allocated it's all completely uh, allocation free right so um so right so the the name of the game is to take this code here which is roughly speaking using the task builder api and make get down to this kind of dotnet il code Except we we that, that that's good. That's a primary aim of this feature, and but we want to actually do a bit more than that as well. Uh, and one we could just do it for tasks and nothing else. But we actually know that there are other things that we want to do this for, and what and I'll run through some of those other things. One of them is task sequences, asynchronous sequences. Okay. So uh, I call that task seek. And in a task seek, you can do something else, which is you can do a yield, yield on a value like three. So let's so we actually do let's do red, yellow, and green. Uh, and this and if these computations are, for instance, asynchronously sleeping then you'll get a asynchronous sequence that yields a value, sleeps on the next one, yields a value, sleeps, yields a value. And these are actually a beautiful programming model. If you've not experienced this programming before, uh, uh, then take a look at fsharp.control.asyncseek, just like you can have task seeks, you can have async seek. And let's take a look at the docs for this. And it's exactly this kind of thing. You can have async seek and you do your yield, then sleep and then yield. There are some uh, examples of this. You can uh, do asynchronous sequences, grouping by mapping, uh, iterating. It's a lovely programming model. Uh, and this has been used a lot in practice. It's a great technique. And uh, it okay so so asynchronous sequences so we also know we want asynchronous task sequences so this is so this the return type of this will be i async innumerable of uh string uh, so we really know we want to do this one c sharp has has asynchronous sequences i mean we already can use them in f sharp with f sharp async seek but Actually, we'd like high performance task sequences as well. So the general thing is we want resumable code, which can also have sort of these functional side effects. Uh, these yield, the, the point about these yields is that they're side effects happening within a particular computational structure. Uh, and that they're, they're, they're sort of side effects that are tamed locally contained and tamed. So we'd quite like to use it for this. We might also want, uh, many of you might know, there's a thing called async maybe, uh, which is roughly speaking at each of your let bang points. Uh, you can, the thing you're returning is a, um, is a maybe. So basically the type of this will be async uh, so async uh, of string option or something like that. And uh, if I've got that right, and it will, it won't do yields, but will rather do let t or some task, or some, some computation like this. And then it will return uh, uh, yellow or something. 
now but the problem the thing is these competition computations are returning option values and if it'll only continue on to the next part of the computation if the thing returned sum if we got a positive result and otherwise the whole thing will end up being none and so this is good and we'd quite like it that if you're going to do tasks move over to task programming well actually task maybe should also compile to efficient code you know all of these things you want the same treatment for it's just that the way that information is processed and put together the bits and pieces of the computation are put together sort of differs in each case it's doing different checks it's doing different maybe cancellation or doing sequences or something there's a kind of the way things are being stitched is, is different but the same basic thing of creating a high performance struct state machine should sort of be the same in each of these cases uh, and there's actually a bunch of other things would actually like more efficient code for non asynchronous things. So, for instance, a maybe, or it's often called option, uh, and this might be called task option to be consistent. Uh, uh, an option monad in F sharp, which would be returning a string option. Well, we'd like that code to be more efficient too. And uh, there are also, uh, as you know, you can have lists or arrays in F sharp like this. And you could do computations where you yield things in the middle, yield one, yield two. That's not asynchronous, uh, but again, it looks like this should be able to be more efficient code. Now we don't use, we actually already do good compilation for these, but we could do even better compilation using the feature that we're talking about today. Okay, so that's the overall picture of what we're trying to achieve from, uh, from the starting point to the ending point. Right, and that brings us across to the RFC for tasks and resumable state machines. And it runs through that, so we want to support tasks and it runs through the kind of constructs that get supported. And then it talks about the more general mechanism. And, uh, the, and the philosophy of this. Okay, now that something I want to point out in this in this compilation from this kind of code down to these struct state machines. Actually, why don't we pause and take questions there? Like, probably been a few coming through. Have there been any? Actually, surprisingly, none. I think like okay. people have just you know just. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, um, feel free. Well, hi. I ha I have a question. Um, because uh, there's no go to statement in F sharp. So, oh, yes. so, so you I, add some yeah. some mechanism yes. uh, to help with yes. that. Yes. So this is going to be done by part of this is going to be done by the compiler. And part of the challenge of this feature is working out what should be done by the compiler and what should be done by the library. And uh, the F sharp compiler already does emit go to statements because we already do this kind of uh, uh, this is a string, uh, actually I'll make it a string sequence. And if you do a sequence uh, expression, uh, these get used so much, or also their list or array equivalents, okay, which also um, use the same mechanism. These get used so much and their performance is so critical that uh, we already do a compilation in the compiler down to a sort of struct state machine like this. And, um, not, uh, but we don't generate a struct, and we uh, we generate an an I enumerable. It will be a state machine that implements I enumerable. And in the generated code, there will be go to statements like this. Did complete will be a little bit different uh, because well, I go through the details of that later. But but basically, you get the idea. We do actually generate this code, and we'll I'll, in a moment I'll look at where we do that in the compiler. Uh, so we do it, okay, so in our overall architecture for the compiler, so we go to the compile, F-sharp compiler guide, uh, which, is, which is here, and it has moved, oh, it doesn't give us a link. Huh. All right, copy it out, we should fix that. It is here, when we look at this, they say, Okay, so we, we have this code generation and then we have IL emit and so on. And this code generation is called ILXGen. 
what are the re so we actually do this at the at this stage here so the go to's don't appear in the intermediate representation until right near the end in fact the very last thing where we're doing this uh, o is ilx code generation uh, so that's partly because they mess up everything else in what you all the all the invariants that you understand hold about the f sharp language and its intermediate representation all go out the window once you chuck go to's into the equation. OK. Uh, good question. Thanks. Any other uh, any more questions there? Oh, yes. See, so Chet is again Sharp Lab. How can I always forget? I should just not use GIST and should use Sharp Lab. And you can see the code here being generated for a sequence expression. And you see there's a helpfully named CLO2. Uh, which is the generator sequence base, which it ultimately implements I enumerable. And you can see this current here got promoted actually to a reference cell here. Okay. Right. And you can see the generate next thing, and you can see the switch statement, and you can see the go to's. You see the labels here. Good. And then the updating of the state. Uh, I should uh, mention what happens if these things uh, capture variables. This is quite, well, let's yield x as we go. Uh, or do x plus current, just use both of them. Then you'll see that that x here gets captured by the state machine and becomes uh, a field of the object. Okay. Fine. Fine, fine. Okay. I'm not sure about that decompilation. That looks a bit, a bit weird, that one. I'm not sure why it is. Yeah, anyway. And yep, and it becomes an innumerable. Okay, let's skip the rest there. Right, uh, questions anymore? So to check when we talk about async being a bit heavy on allocations, should you continue questions that correctly? Something done to actually put these. Uh, Yes, so we do, of course, put a function down for each of the continuations, but you still, you when you capture the continuation, you have to allocate. I mean, there's an invoke function for each of the continuations, but you, you can't um, keep anything on the stack, so you have to put the continuation on the heap. Yeah, so yeah, through actual allocating an object who has, has a virtual method slot, which calls that invoke function, which is sort of laying down that continuation. So yes, you that is correct. But that's the state of things presently. Part of the slowdown owing to allocations is that it's heap allocated. That that's right. Uh, you can, and they sort of they have to be heap allocated, uh, or, or else yeah, nothing. You can't actually do an asynchronous continuation. Right. Okay. Um, so let's. We talked about compiler guide and where this thing is happening, where the go-tos are going to get inserted. And now we have to talk about how we're going to split this baby, split this baby between um, library and compiler. Uh, OK, so some of it has to be in the library, right? Because if you look at all the different things, where's my gist gone here? You know, look at all these different things. We can't possibly go and bake all of these into the F sharp compiler. So some of this has to be in the library. Uh, so what are the bits that have to be in the compiler? Well, let's just list them out. Roughly speaking, it has to be the ability to lay down asynchronous, uh, lay down resumable code. OK, so we have to have a general ability to generate code like this. 
uh, the, these switch statements and these cases and these, this kind of, uh, so with these, well, not all of this, some of this is specific to uh, async to tasks, but we have to generate the go-tos and so on. Uh, now, and we also want the ability just to kind of cons up the state machine type. So the compiler, when it comes across a task, it it, it implements, uh, it emits a, a state machine. And we also want the ability to lay down struct state machines in particular, and that that is relevant to the RFC. Uh, okay, so. If we were ignoring structs, so let's just, and sometimes you don't want to the whole machinery of structs, then the simplest place to start is um, is a oh no I'm going to give one guiding thing as well. This whole this whole thing, you only want this compilation to happen if you're actually compiling this code. Okay. There's a problem that happens if you're not compiling it, but if you're interpreting this code, and you can interpret code in F-sharp by taking a quotation of the code. Okay, so the, the kind of, whenever we have a feature like this, the question is, what is the quotation going to be? Well, that's already defined in F-sharp. We actually know what the quotation of this is. It's actually the, the desugaring of this into option.bind, uh, it actually gets a thing called option dot delay of option dot uh, so these are bind points bind 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 da da da. Okay, so I won't write it all out, but it, but we know what this is. So this is sort of equivalent to this. And of course, you can you can do quotation dot eval on this thing or whatever. It's not there is no eval built in, but there are libraries around you can get for F sharp. Oh, there are some evaluators built in. There's a leaf expression evaluator built into the F-sharp core library uh, for queries, and there's also other quotation evaluators uh, and compilers around if you want to do that. And you could also rewrite this thing if you want. Uh, you could do my rewrite on it, and you could evaluate it and so on. But you won't get state machines at the end. So this thing still has to have a valid semantics, and we need to be able to write library components that have on the one hand, compile to highly efficient code. The other hand, also have an equal and equivalent interp uh, interpreted or sort of dynamically executed semantics. OK, so we have to be able to play both games. And other, if we don't, then basically you start to get language features like task or option or things like that, which you can't use in quotations and you can't use uh, in, the, in an interpreter written over the F-sharp compiler service. And you probably can't use them with Fable, and that's not, you know, and other things, and that's not a good situation to be in, right? So we want, we want, uh, we we want a, a, a an interpretive, uh, dynamically executed version of, of this stuff as well, which is why when we look at the RFC, the first thing that's described is this construct here, and let's uh, just pick this apart here. So the, the very first thing we describe in the solution, there's lo it's lots of requirements phrasing, is the ability to have this as a new and sort of special construct in the F-sharp language or the F-sharp compiler. So the, the idea is that the library writer is making a promise that this dynamic implementation is equivalent to this stuff up here. And if we're in a mode where we can use resumable state machines, that is we can assume uh, that we can use these special constructs. That is, we're actually compiling the F-sharp code. You can think of this as if underscore underscore compiled as a special kind of flag that gets known to be true when, uh, when uh, compiling code, otherwise it's considered to be false. Uh, then, uh, then you get to use this construct. And what you're saying here with resumable state machine, I don't care what the names are, we'll probably change these names. I use underscore underscore because like, hey, it's a compiler intrinsic, right? It's a special construct of the language, but we don't want to go change the syntax of the language because this is really only for library writers and not for general users to go and write this stuff because the, the library writer has to be good at this stuff. Uh, and uh, and actually, because they have to make sure this is equivalent to this, okay? And that, that's an art in itself. Uh, 
So I don't care if it's got double underscore, but I don't care what the names are either, but it is a light compiler intrinsic. So uh, now this thing is going to say it's going to uh, create a, a new closure object and it's going to rewrite this resumable code under special, the compiler is going to rewrite this resumable code under special conditions it's, and allow you to use special constructs in this resumable code, which are also only known to the compiler. And you can only use them there. You're not allowed to use them in the dynamic implementation. So this is construct number one. So compiler feature number one, resumable code. Uh, we'll call this host for consumers. Uh, uh, reference type host for heap allocated resumable state machines. Oh, actually, I just, that's uh, something to say. Let's call it that heap allocated resumable state machines. Okay. Now, the problem is we actually uh, we pull off this RFC here. Uh, so, okay. We actually know, I've already told you, we already want structs as well. So now the problem is, you know, F sharp, it's, it's nice to start with this point because this is a closure construct in F sharp. It's an object expression. Okay. So actually, it's quite natural to think of a state machine as an object with a, just a funky method called step. So the, 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 the thing is, and, that it, the, and because it's an expression, it means it can capture uh, things uh, like you saw in that capturing thing before. It's, it's actually, it's quite a, a natural expression of a resumable state machine. The problem is we want to do structs and you can't do struct object expressions in F sharp. You can't do struct blah, 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 because it doesn't really make sense to do that uh, because you need a type for uh, it could be we could sort of, uh, yeah, that, that, so in F sharp object expressions, uh, the overall type of this expression will be some state machine type. The problem is, uh, so, and you will generate a class with it which inherits from that type and we'll, and we'll fill in the step method and so on. But if the problem is with structs, you can't do inheritance with structs. They can implement interfaces, but they can't implement you can't get a new struct type in this kind of setting. So, so it's very difficult to know what to do about this in F-sharp. Do you try and put in some uh, sort of struct object expression? A lot of point because there's not much you can do with that. So what we've actually done is to say, actually, if you really, really want a struct, there's a different compiler intrinsic, which actually wraps things up as a bit differently. It actually is always a struct that implements uh, what's necessary for tasks. So it implements this I async state machine. And this struct, so this is this construct is saying to the compiler, lay me down a struct. And what do you do with that struct? Well, you, f you fill in a move next method on the struct. You fill in, uh, you use this struct as kind of a template. You allow this stuff to uh, uh, capture things. It can have a move next method as set state machine, and then it does something with that struct. It eliminates that struct, and uh, the and these uh, and then kind of starts running the task, for example. So this is compiler feature number two, and it is actually a very awkward feature to think of any really better way of doing this feature that, you know. This does what's necessary to give us structs when we need them. It works. So this is back of suck slash struct allocated resumable state machines. It does the job. I don't really know how to make it better as a language feature. I don't really want to make it better because I don't think it's that useful to have it as probably the, the complexity we would have to do to make it better, more orthogonal, isn't really worth it because we don't have any real, really important use cases for, for people wanting to do object expression structs. And they, they're a confusing thing to offer to the programmer in general. OK, so this anyway, this, this is that compiler feature. Two. Pilot number three is what is resumable code? OK, so let's take questions before I do that. OK. Uh, 
Yeah, so no particular questions, people joining in. Nice to have you all along. Lots of Russian names. I'm sorry, I can't read Cyrillic. Uh, I used to be able to as a kid. I, 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 I learned myself quite a lot of Russian for, uh, you know, the basics of a lot for a person who lives in Australia. So uh, sorry, I can't say your, your names uh, uh, accurately, but uh, I, I wish I'd learned more. Uh, right, so no questions yet. If there are any questions, I could pause right now. If anyone wants to offer a question by voice, that's also fine. Okay, no questions, and we'll continue on. Uh, compiler feature number three, uh, resumable code. So what is resumable code and what is this resumable code? Uh, and that is in our RFC. So, uh, okay. So first of all, we allow, uh, I won't copy all of these out, I'll make them a bit bigger. Uh, we allow resumable code to be uh, something, these kind of calling something else that is resumable code that is marked as inline. Uh, we also allow those things that you call, call twice here, to take parameters which are themselves sort of resumable code. And at the moment, there's the macro system in a way, because we want to kind of allow the library writer to expand out the body of the state machine until all the asynchronous constructs are revealed. The entire content of the state will be expanded. And so I am not, as many of you know, I'm not keen on putting a general macro system into F sharp for lots and lots of reasons. But this does require some macro like elements. And at the moment, and this will probably change as we take this through another design iteration, just the naming will change. Maybe you'll put an attribute on this thing uh, to say this is actually a macro function uh, thing. This print is being passed in here. And it, it uh, you can, so these things can take parameters with double underscore expand. And then that is equivalent to doing that. And then calling those two things, which is equivalent to calling print twice. Uh, you can also, uh, well, these uh, these arise from inline functions. You, the invocation I've already said. Uh, you can also have expansion delegates, and this is important for a reason that these functions that you're passing around here can actually be delegates as well. And there's a very important reason for that because delegates can pass around the address of a struct. They can pass around by refs. F sharp functions cannot pass by refs as arguments. Delegates can. And we have to pass around the address of the struct state machine through threading down through the code as we're expanding out the body of the async task of the task. So you have to these things can be delegates here. OK, so they OK. So now there's one other construct that you're uh, allowed, which is you're allowed to lay down labels. And you think, am I going to add labels into F sharp just for this particular purpose? No, I'm not going to do that. So instead, we have a compiler intrinsic, which has the effect of a label. And the idea here is that when you call resumable entry, uh, it returns uh, notionally kind of returns an integer which represents the label. The compiler knows about this stuff and actually just lays down a label instead. And uh, and then it can save that, it can use that um, that label inside the code. And in fact, the label for the code, uh, so I'll just put this here, copy this across to the gist. That this, if you have code like this, it roughly becomes. Uh, so we'll give this R code one, R code two. This roughly becomes R code one. 
except that this now has access to the continuation ID. I'll just put that in brackets like this. And then you get uh, continuation ID. So uh, here, and it becomes uh, our code two. So for instance, in the middle of this, you could, you could sort of omit a go to in here. So let's have a look at what the go to looks like. Uh, the um, that becomes resume at uh, that's right. So okay, so resume resume at says go to a particular label. So the R code one, for instance, could have print hello. Then I uh, resume at D and then print goodbye and then print goodbye would never actually be executed. Uh, because yes, okay. It will become this code would go here. Go to attenuation ID, and this is whatever R code two becomes. Okay. The other thing that resumable code can have uh, can have sequencing of resumable code. You are allowed to say there are some things that we don't want to actually capture and want to stay on the stack. Uh, so, and that this is sort of data that is not going to be used before any resumption point. So uh, before it's just going to be immediately used in the next step. So you can, for instance, expand some task, uh, run some task, and then check the stack step and then do expand task two. And that is a condition which will be checked by the compiler. It's not currently checked, but all these conditions will eventually be checked by the compiler. That's part of finishing the feature. Resumable code can have resumable while loops. And because this stuff is resumable, that means you can jump directly into this code. So it may contain resumption points. And similarly for this code, sorry, this code here, actually I have code. And similarly try with. And uh, then you can have match expressions, of course, you can have let expressions. And uh, that is it. Um, right, so, and just to say that these labels here that you get from resume, from making resumable entry points can be saved away into some resumption point, and then you can resume at not only an actual known label, but you could resume at some saved resumption point using resume out, and that's how you do the jump at the start of the method, the switch at the start of the method. Okay, so that's a spec, a rough spec here, and some of the details in the RFC, they'll need some polishing, but that's the rough spec of what e resumable state machines are, what resum resumable code is. And we've talked about uh, state machine structs, and that is actually more or less the whole feature, and the rest is library code. And those three things are enough for us to build all of this kind of goodness up here. All those different uses of, where are they? Uh, loss and task sequence. All these task option, task sequence, etc. And we can actually build a whole lot more things. You can do efficient uh, parser combinators. Uh, I believe so. Uh, this is, I believe, I, uh, all that needs to be proved. Proved so much more efficient. Okay. And I think there are many more applications to um, to DSLs. Okay, to, to hyper DSLs. Perf low allocation. 
OK, so a good litmus test is that if you actually that the compiler is doing a thing, this thing well is if you actually have synchronous code with uh, using uh, those uh, so made into F sharp computation expressions and then eliminated out using what I was just showing you, then it should run as fast as the, the, the code. So this should roughly be performance wise equivalent to code. Uh, and with very, very, very little overhead, uh, nothing more than a jump or something like that, and possibly no overhead at all. So let's talk about what goes in the library now. And again, a chance to take questions if there are any. Please just uh, dive in and say. Actually, uh, I have questions on. Uh, yeah. When you, like, when we're talking about resumable uh, code, how does the compiler handle or doesn't handle the recursive code? Right, good question. Uh, good, good question. So at the moment, resumable code is uh, it can be a, a function, a recursive function, but it can, uh, but each recursive invocation of that will so. Uh, it's a good it's a good question and we should make sure we capture that in the RFC and compare to C sharp uh, well it'll be the same as C sharp uh, so at the moment if you have some function some recursive function which is a task you do this you do its stuff and then at the very bottom of that the very last thing it does is a return bang on the recursive function okay or perhaps a do bang, but let's just be kind and say it's a return bang. Then this will uh, this will actually create an endless chain of tasks. No, it, no, it, 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 let me let me let me think about this carefully. So. Yeah, this this will be roughly this will be. Uh, it won't let me let me let me think. Uh, let me not get this wrong. Let's take a look at. Um, So the, the the question will come down to what does return from do in the task library. So it's kind of um, so if I look at task.fs. We look at the interface file, signature file. Then you'll see some of these constructs I've been talking about, and you'll see we have a task builder here. And you'll see we have return from here. And it takes a task as the argument. And let's look at the implementation. Okay. Uh, and so this is the code it will lay down for this task. So first of all, a task is created, which is an allocation point. So it will allocate that thing. So it will have, sorry, it will, uh, yeah, so if we go back to the, to the gist, then calling this thing will have both created the task and run some of that task to its first completion point. So we get the awaiter for that task. 
and we then check if the task is completed and if so we get the result from that away i'm looking at this i'm thinking immediately this can be made more efficient if the task has actually completed synchronously that this if task is completed should actually probably be listed up above the task dot get a waiter but i need to double check that very carefully uh, so basically there will be costs at that recursive call for, for sure there will be some kind of of allocation and there'll be some kind of awaiting the results so you will actually get an inf potentially infinite sequence of tasks and you will not get a tail calling task we could add to the specification of resumable code uh the fact that you can i need to think carefully you can go back to the start of the current the current effectively adding tail calls into the specification of resumable code. It's not easy to do that and I have to think very carefully about that. But basically recursive tasks are, are not the same as recursive asyncs in their tail calling structure. And it's, it's important for people to know that they're not the same in task builder and it's not the same in, um, in, in this either. Okay, it's in the nature of tasks, and it's one of the reasons why F sharp async is, a, is in some ways a better programming model. Super important topic, actually. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, okay, so I was going to start to show you some of the library code, and you'll let let's take a look at the uh, a simple use of the feature. Uh, so. Actually, it is in the files here. And I will jump to uh, a use of this code for the uh, for I think. Let's try this one. OK, so this is a use of the, the features that we've got to re-implement the seek construct in F sharp. So this is a seek builder and it allows you to do there we go let's seek two so i've called it seek two because it's a replacement for the seek in f sharp and it's it allows you to do seek with yield 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 like like this and it for loops and so on it's all it's all the same and you can compare the performance comparison you can do the it implements i enumerable and so on so let's see how that works for some of the constructs so for instance let's look at what combine becomes okay so let's let's look at so combine is the sequence we've got one task here and we've got another task and inside the computation expression each part of the well they're not tasks these are sort of fragments of of the computation and the the internal type inside the computation expression is this seek code thing so let's look at what seek code is and it is each of these they're composing up little functions each of which take a seek state machine and return you a boolean. And the boolean, these are effectively fragments of the move next function. And we're, com we're sequentially composing two of these. And we say, what do we get? Well, we get back a new composition of those two functions. But the composition we get depends on whether we're using resumable state machines or not. So if we're doing, if we're compiling these things, well, if we're not, then well, we can look at what we do later. But if we are, compiling these things, then uh, we, we expand out the code for the first task and it returns a Boolean. So these things are allowed to return a value. And then uh, if that Boolean took a step, uh, then so if it, it, it um, yeah, so if we haven't reached the end of the sequence, then we do actually it's the other way around. If it has, if we have done the end of the sequence, then we can move on and do the second code. Otherwise we return false. Okay. So, uh, OK, so we look at what zero returns here in the computation expression. That's the empty, uh, empty, empty fragments. They always return 
true to say the thing has completed. So it's actually the opposite of the move next, uh, the other way around. And if we look at what while loops do, then they uh, they put a thing on the stack here, then while uh, stack completed and actually run the code for the, the guard, and we expand out the body, we save that away and go back around the while loop. And remember, this is resumable code that we're specifying here. So that means that resumptions can jump back into this expanded body at some point. OK, so you can see that basically you, you're using the macro system to lay out the code for according to the rules of resumable code. Now let's take a look at what happens when we run the thing. And that's where we use this uh, heap allocating resumable state machine. And we get the object expression that represents that. And then we have the uh, at the top of the function, we have the resumption, which goes to the resumption that's saved in the state machine. So that's SM here is the, uh, the, the name of the state machine that we're running. And then we expand out that code with respect to that state machine. So we pass that down because sequence code was all sort of fragments of the move next of the step method. And that's fine. And then we start the thing here. And that start method is let's go look at our state machine type. So this is a sequence state machine here. And it has a move next. I've got a feeling that's a bug, and I should actually say not step. I've forgotten. Does move next return true if it succeeds in the move? So I think it, it should be the other way around. Uh, uh, I've got to double check that. Uh, and then this thing implements I enumerable, and it has three fields the current state of the enumerator, the resumption point which is the label it's going to jump to, which is represented as an integer in this world. Uh, and it also has this resumption func. And the resumption func is the function to use if we're doing dynamic interpretation, if we're doing interpreted interpretation. And so in each of these cases, if uh, let's take a look at combination, if we're not able to compile away the state machines, so we run down this path. This is what's actually in the F# -sharp library at runtime. Uh, runtime, if the library code needs to be called dynamically, then it will run the task and uh, and look at the values. And if it fails to complete, then it makes up a new continuation, which will keep doing that and doing that and doing that until the the step actually completes. Uh, so that's what that's what all this is for. Okay. So that so the basically the rule is that the dynamic uh, implementation uses resumption func, and the uh, the non-dynamic implementation uses the representation of those resumption funks representing the continuations as integers. Okay, cool. So that's great. So we've used all our mechanisms there, and we've used almost the full spec of resumable code in achieving that. Uh, we can look at a couple of other points, like what happens with the try finalies and try widths and so on. And you can look at what happens with a yield struct. A yield is a yield point. A yield is important because that's where we do the resumable entry. And we say, oh, actually, let's save away that resumption point. And this is where we store the value in current to say, hey, we've got a, we've actually got a current value for this iterator. And uh, otherwise, we clear out the value and we run on with our uh, our continuation uh sorry here this is this is the this is the continuation point this is where the label gets laid down in these constructs okay so that's all very nice uh, uh we've used all our constructs now you might say what was going on with all that task stuff that we looked at before so this is what we've got now is enough to do option builders. It's enough to do uh, to do um, sequences, lists. It's enough to do async and tasks. So, but tasks are a little bit more complex. Let's have a look. This is our test suite.
Okay, task.fs here. And they're complex because we actually get a lot of what was done in task builder uh, coming in to the um, to the implementation. So some of this will now look familiar. So task state machine, it's a struct, okay, because we want to squeeze out that little bit of extra performance. And it holds a result, we, we expect that. And it holds uh, the, what we saw before for the case, resumption points and resumption funks. And, but it also might do an asynchronous await. And in those cases, the resumption func has to have a corresponding awaiter here. And uh, the struct has to hold this method builder as part of building the struct. And that's all fine. The, the notion of code, the code fragments, in the previous example, we saw that they were little functional fragments that get put together. In this case, they're going to be delegate fragments. And that is, whenever you're using a struct state machine, you need to use delegates because you have to be able to pass these by refs to get like the address back further down the stack of the task state machine. And otherwise, things are going to look fairly similar uh, to what we saw. The combined function is going to be kind of similar, and the other members on the builder for the syntax is are all going to be kind of similar. And then they're going to be dynamic uh, implementations. We're actually going to in inline all of these, which is what we expect because they contain resumable code. They're used to build up resumable code. And if we look at task.fs, here, um, oh, I, I should, I should, before I look at this, I'm going to explain a little bit more. Um, OK, the problem is we looked at those builders and there was a crucial one missing, and that is what is binding. And there's no binding and there's no return from so so far. So uh, the, and the reason for that is that task builder. So when you do tasks in C sharp. Uh, so it, so basically C sharp uh, tasks uh, can await tasks. So you can wait task, C sharp async code, and wait task. It can await task of T. It can also await things called, which is like task like things, uh, that fo which is basically structs following, following, the, uh, following a compiler pattern, following a pattern. Ooh, this is a little bit awkward because uh, it's not captured in the first class thing. Uh, and so the, the reason I do this is to avoid a few more allocations. And things like, uh, you'll notice this if you do task.sleep, uh, or delay, I think it's called, delay 100. Then the thing returned is a task-like thing. It has a particular pattern. And so the way Task Builder deals with this is to use F-sharp constraints, SRTP, and its bind method here, uh, it's pretty complex the way it does it. It uses this, this particular form of SRTP. But its bind task has is inline and has its constraints and eventually looks for, actually, it's this, this overload of bind here for this task-like thing here, and then calls this generic, generic await to do this. And it's an interesting bit of comp of magic that they use. What I will do is show you the constraints on a task-like thing. So a task-like thing has to have an awaiter, and it has to return a type that is a subtype of critical notify completion, and, and that thing has to have is completed and get result. And that captures, that set of constraints in F-sharp roughly captures the comp compiler pattern it pretty exactly captures the compiler pattern that the C sharp compiler call, language spec calls the task like thing. We use a similar thing with return from in there. And we also make it that you can actually bind to both tasks and to async here. So you can bind, can bind to async, and you can return from tasks and you can return from asyncs. And that's nice because it lets us do good interoper interoperation with F sharp async. Uh, and 
then all OK, so that explains all of that. And basically the uh, the bind here then becomes something which has has an appropriate can bind operation up further up in the file. This is this complicated, but it's OK. I think it seems to work OK for user code. It doesn't result in bad error messages that I've seen. Uh, it certainly doesn't give any compilation overhead, so I'm pretty happy with this. I wouldn't have I actually wouldn't have wanted to write this myself. Actually, it's complicated code, but then this pattern is very complicated. Equally, I don't really want to bake in that pattern into the F sharp compiler. So I'm quite happy to have it done in the library like this. I really don't want to have to do that. It's quite a complicated bespoke thing to put into your compiler, and I don't want to do that. So I'm, I'm, I'm OK with this. It's, it's, there's a downside to it, but it's coping with the complexity that is real, and I think it's OK. Uh, but that explains what all that goop of SRTP code is. So let's take a look at now, armed with all that knowledge about what we're going to encounter along the way, we can de finally delve into tasks.fs. And let's be brave and look at uh, look at um, let's look at who let's do what we did before. Let's look at combine. And this is very similar. So we have uh, we've got two fragments of task code coming in. We expand one out. We expand another one out. Lay down the resumable code. And if we're not doing this, then we go and call the dynamic implementation over here. Fine, which is further down here. And you can, and then that does the stuff with resumption func down here. Does an explicit invoke on the delegates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's all okay. Uh, it looks very similar to what we had before. Let's have a look what happens when you run a task. Well, it lays down. A, so this is the this is the thing on the outside of the task method. So when I have a, when I have a task, and we have say a term one, this is equivalent to task dot run of task dot return okay. this syntax in the sharp is equivalent to that so it wraps this run method around i call it the run method around sorry if there's fireworks in the background uh of course they're in the, in the audio it's a lot of noise going off here at the moment i don't know why they're celebrating but uh right so let's look at the run thing so it lays down the struct uh, takes uh, that that uses task state machine as the, 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 the template for that struct, and it fills in the move next method and the set state machine, and then does this code afterwards. So let's take a look at the move next method. It resumes at the resumption point, and then it tries. Uh, oh, it lays down the code. Okay, so we're expanding out some code here, and like this will be that thing about getting the body of the task method, tries to take a step. And if it completes, then we've got a result and we set the overall result for the method builder uh, to whatever the result we saved away is. And if we get an exception from that, we set the exception condition. So the whole of the resumable code is wrapped in an exception handler and on we go. And if we didn't take a step, if we didn't complete, then no result is set and we just we're done with what with our move next. So the move next in tasks signals its completion by setting the result or not. This is set state machine allows the struct to be picked up and reused, uh, reinstantiated at a later point when resumed. And uh, this after method here says once we've done all of this and so we've actually got our struct state machine, then we actually start create this method builder. This is part of building the task, and we start the task and we re return the task, uh, and then that is exactly how C sharp. If you look at what C sharp generates for tasks, it's effectively exactly this code. 
So uh, this is laying down in the library what the C-sharp bakes into their compiler. And so that's good. And if as homework, if you like, you can go and look at what each of these functions do. So choose a function like try with and check how it works and uh, and think about the resumable code that is being laid down. Think carefully about what it might mean to jump into the middle of this code. So for instance, we're jumping into the middle of a try with here. Uh, turns out .NET IL has some very special rules about whether you're allowed to do that or not. Uh, so, um, but those those are looked after by the compiler. Uh, and uh, okay, so but this is all valid IL. It generates valid IL for valid inputs. Okay, and that I think is everything. Uh, the end result is what we need. I'll just show it in terms of performance figures. So let's take a look at, at this. Uh, if I, why my thing is not refreshing? Ah, still on. Okay, let's take a look. Yeah, here we go. Uh, so. This example is, uh, sorry, something is being very slow in. Yeah, no, it's been crazy. Huh. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, this is not, not a happy, not a happy browser tab. Let's try a new one. Right. See, it doesn't like any changes in zooming. I think you can probably see this now. I'll just leave it. So this is comparing exactly the same code for C sharp async and tasks and F sharp async. And uh, you can look at the performance, the average performance time, and you can see that F sharp async is slower. It's doing more allocations, but crucially, F sharp task our uh, task builder is doing a little bit better but f sharp task is doing exactly the same number of allocations and really i mean th these two things is sort of for this kind of be benchmark this is in the wash the difference between those two uh the again for another thing the key thing is is that the number of allocations is the same there's a slight difference here there have been cases where f sharp async comes out identical i think it's just a matter of like cache alignments and things like that i don't think we're doing anything fundamentally wrong in f sharp async in fact this one here is actually better than c sharp async by margin a small margin but uh, it does have a slightly slightly more allocation that might be the one extra field in the state machine Objects. I'm not sure about that. Or there's, there might be a miss uh, typo in the benchmark. Uh, uh, this one does absolutely no allocation at all, and you compare to that to how much F# -sharp async is doing. Uh, you know, uh, a me megabyte of, of allocation compared to nothing. Uh, and these are some other ones that are comparing list builders to list expressions. These are not perfect yet, and I think they may actually look at that thing. There may have been mistakes in that code. This is comparing synchronous code to normal, so looping code to workflow code, that sync thing. And sure enough, the performance is actually very, very similar. For some reason, it turns out the, 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 the workflow code actually ends up slightly faster. The allocation is the same. That's a very good result. I'm very, very happy with that one. And this is task seek. Uh, it's not yet perfect. It's not yet finished as an example. You can see that F sharp async seek is using a lot more allocation, but C sharp async uh, has reduced those allocations down even further. So there must be a little bit more work, but I'm pretty confident that can be done in the library and not be done in the compiler, that we've correctly factored between the two so that all the hard work of getting perfect performance is actually in the library code, which is way, way easier to. Uh, to maintain and implement then anything in the actual any actual compiler optimizations. Okay, so we can finish up there. I think I uh, take more and take any questions. The 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 end result is um, 
you know, it's it's what we need it to, to be for this feature. This feature isn't about more semantics. It doesn't actually mean that the F sharp language does anything more than it ever did before. You can do all this stuff today. You just get better code out the end. Uh, and uh, it, it's a complicated feature, but these compilers are doing a complicated thing at this point. And uh, there are other ways perhaps to cut this feature, especially if you don't try and make it reusable. But I think we're doing the right thing in kind of making it a reusable thing for these different computational structures. Given that F sharp has computational expressions, we may as well get efficient code for as many of those as need it. And uh, I, let's take uh, questions if there are any. I know that's a su oh, oh, what I should do is show the actual part of the compiler that actually does this work. Uh, that is in the files here. And this is in, it's called lower state machines. So this is the only code, only files added to the compiler. And it's called lower state machines here. And this is called in the last phase of code generation and calls this one function called uh, convert state machine expression. Sorry, where is it? Here, convert state machine expression to object. And that is the thing that does all the thing about what is resumable code, copy the struct type across, uh, do all those implementation of the compiler features is all done in this here. And 840 lines of the, the, the rewrite that we do on the code. And if you run through it, then there's a part here to expand out macros here. And there is the, where is it? Somewhere here, there's a spec of resumable code. Here, this is this is it here. This is convert state machine code. And each of these constructs should uh, detect the different permitted constructs in the resumable code. So they correspond to what's in the RFC, the resume at expression or the while expression or sequential state machine code and so on try finally for loops these are the constructs you're allowed to use and they've each got a each got a rewrite associated with those okay so uh that's a super deep technical topic today uh chet has got a question what kind of library tools are there who'd like to use the new mechanism to execute inspect code it will be well i guess you'll be able to use sharp lab to actually author all, uh, so I'd say SharpLab. Once SharpLab hosts the F Sharp compiler that has this feature, then you will simply be able to do that entire development in SharpLab, including of the builder and all those if expressions, and uh, that 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 will be perfect. Actually, it would have made my life a lot easier if I had that uh, had that available. Uh, at the moment, it's just uh, compile up the Bootstrap compiler and uh, in that branch or compile that branch and use the compiler and use ILDASM is, is the current technique. Um, Kevin from the chat has a question. He, he raised his hand, so. Oh yeah, Kevin, hey, or maybe that's from, yeah, Ke Kevin, you got a question? Uh, yeah, so would you be able to implement something like Task Builder outside of fsharp.core or this is only for Sharp that, that's a policy decision still to be made. I, I, I mean, because of the way the feature is shaped, I want to use it outside F sharp core for sure. Uh, so we, it's possible. I mean, it's possible we might phase the transition out of preview into two steps. One is where we uh, have the task uh, support for F sharp core becomes non preview. And then the the use of the feature outside F sharp core stays in preview, just in just in case we haven't done all the checks on validity of. Uh, uh, for example, we could actually ship the feature as it is today, with uh, the task support in F sharp core turned off preview, 
and the actual sort of use of the extensibility, extensible mechanism in Preview. And yeah, without even doing any of the checks on the validity of that code. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, we, we could do that because we know by manual inspection that that task stuff is, is valid, resumable code. So um, yes, but yes, well. you, you, the answer is yes, you will be able to. The exact policy over when it's uh, whether you can do that and when it's taken out of preview is something we'll work on uh, as a community. Just, just to clarify, not even just specifically the task code, but state machines in general. Uh, that's right. So task will, will be built into F sharp core. Right. And the, the general compiler mechanisms is what I was referring to as to yes. Yeah, so to build your own sequence. Uh, to build your own uh, may, uh, async maybe or replacement async or any of those sort of things. Yeah. Okay, so you will be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the whole okay. the, the whole design of the feature is absolutely for things outside F sharp core. We don't want to be putting every builder in the world into F sharp core. And I do believe this. You know, in the big context, it's actually. Uh, it's actually a bit of a holy grail in these languages to have a very reusable notion of com of computation, co you know, uh, and yet get very efficient code at the end of that. And so I'm I'm certain that in my kind of intuition that even well beyond the examples I've shown, there'll be many examples of this the use of this mechanism uh, to give high performance computational structures. We would use it in the compiler. We had these eventually computations. We probably would have used it for those. No, it's not a big deal for performance, but uh, you've got to be careful about people overusing this feature when they don't need it. It's a big risk with this kind of thing. It's like, as I said, it doesn't add anything semantically to the F sharp language. So people will use it when they don't need it. There will be some people in the world who do that. And we, yeah. And luckily, I, I think writing that resumable code is. It's hard enough that they they will be careful. They will learn, learn to be careful. <laughs> okay, and then with quotations, um, would the witness passing allow for generating efficient code in, say, type providers, or you pretty much have to go into the type providers SDK and switch how that generates the IL? Uh, no, that so that is so. Today, when you hand back quotations to the F sharp compiler from the type provider, this is sort of a different use of quotations, right? We use it as the sort of code format that the type providers pass across back to the compiler. We, we laid out pretty efficient code for that. We turned that back into typed abstract syntax trees, and it and it it it, it is efficient. Uh, I don't think we would ever allow those things to specify resumable code. That 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 that, that that's best done in a library, not not in those quotations. Uh, I'm not sure if that was a question, though. I think one of those two might have been a question. Yeah, pretty much. So basically, if you were to do this from a type provider, you wouldn't really expect efficient code. Uh, in fact, it would be outright banned. I think. I think. Uh, I, I don't. I mean, it is orthogonal in the compiler, but it, it, to return those special intrinsics back to the compiler, yeah, that 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 that, that, that it might work, but no one will do it. I think is the expression. Well, I guess we can put it in the test case, but it's extremely corner case test, test case. Well, we a yeah. task builder wouldn't be banned, right? You would you would end up with the dynamic code, which would just be a little bit less efficient. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. So if you're going to generate task fragments, so task yeah. curly fragments, yeah, then you can hand those back, and that'll be just just fine. In fact, yeah, yeah, that's no problem. That that's all done in the very early phase of the compiler. Before optimization and everything, so in fact you will get you will get compiled code coming out. You will get efficient code. You, you will get. You will. Yeah, like yeah, you, because, you won't yeah, get the I dynamic mean, binds being called. If you if you if you for some reason decide that your ta your type provider should return a task curly a curly braces expression, then it will pass all that back to the compiler, and the compiler will just say, yeah, sure, I'll compile that. And it's, what, what it's, if you were doing a generated generated um, uh, no, type then, provider? Then you're using then, it. Then it won't. Yes. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Then it won't. But to be honest, uh, in all of those cases, when you're writing type providers, the 
the guidance is to put as little as possible into those quotations, really, and to put as much into library support code as possible. So in it, for any complicated expressions, even for something like a task, it's probably better to put it in some library support code. Uh, oh, probably, but yeah. ultimately, uh, for my own DSLs, I use the type provider SDK to compile oh, down to IL. Okay. Oh, you do? Okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah, so. <laughs> okay, that's good Good. Good to know. Well, good to know it's all, it's, uh, it's, it's working, it's good. Right, uh, I see the comment about Darklang recently picked. Do you think the feature will help them? I, I no, not not particularly. They're not using. Uh, I don't. I presume they're not using .NET as their runtime for Darklang. Uh, and uh, this particular feature, I think uh, there's loads of good features. You've read what people have written. What what. Uh, um, sorry, I've just forgotten the, the name. It was just tweeting with me before the guy does Darklang. Um, Slipped off the top of my head. Paul Bigger. Uh, Paul uses F sharp for all sorts of good reasons, but no, this feature should not be one that he will particularly notice. He did he did mention asynchronous code in the discussion about why he was choosing F sharp. So maybe. He has a perf issues around that. There might be so. Um, yes. So, but not. I mean, it's not for any of their compilation part, but they do do asynchronous programming. Will it improve debugging? Yes, I believe it will greatly improve debugging of async code because we are generating exactly the same code as C sharp, and all the debugging mechanisms are set up to assume that kind of code and provide causality for those kind of code. I've done some tests along those lines. I think they're listed in the long implementation uh, pull requests about what I have and haven't done. We will certainly please today, you can get that branch, you can compile up tests, you can go and whack down some breakpoints and tell us if what you're seeing is good enough or not. So, uh, and help fix it or just at least give us the information about what you're seeing. There's nothing, with debugging is the sort of thing where things can easily slip through the cracks uh, if we don't get real world users kind of actually hitting on it pretty early on. Uh, so please, please do just compile up that branch and uh, hopefully, you know, in the next few months, we might get this into preview and then you'll be able to use it in preview editions of tooling as well. Um, Don, I, uh, if I may ask, like a small question. What about documentation? I, I presume the, we, we we can can publish something later based on uh, the, the the final design we will agree on, right? Absolutely. The the RFCs tend to tend to be the central documentation point. I do expect there will be design refinements on this whole thing. You can you can tell there are some parts of it like naming and actually just how some of the maybe. It's quite possible people here will say, yeah, look, you know, I think if you just factor this struct stuff a little bit differently, it kind of just looks a little bit cleaner. You know, I know it looks messy today because it's it's achieving a result that we need to achieve. Uh, it, it's just like someone is, people are bound to have good ideas about how to improve that part, the bits of the design. So we will see a little bit of design change and we will, the RFC will be the primary documentation. And we will need a separate, we will of course have a guide in the F-sharp docs about task programming. If there are gotchas in task programming, like recursive tasks or something like that, then we will document them there. And uh, it'll be part of the F-sharp core, so it'll be part of the, F the core experience of using F-sharp. And I got to say a huge thank you to um, Robert Peel, who did, a sp a is it? Oh, I just got to check, uh, who did Task Builder and has made it available to the community. Uh, I think Robert Peel from North Carolina. Uh, he yeah, published here free time as a hobby. This is just fabulous contribution to the community. And uh, this is absolutely for me, he gave a semantic starting point and uh, for this work. And so huge thank you to uh to robert and uh we have to we'll make sure the big thank you was done in the did, done in the f sharp 
credits for that as as well. So in a way, Robert sort of co-authored this. The other person who I've uh, enjoyed working a lot with on this is Nino, Nino Fiores from the Netherlands. And he's done a library called Ply, which is kind of taking, uh, I'll show that up for people who are interested in this space, because there might be some um, performance tweaks we can get from this. High performance TPL library for F sharp. Uh, and so this is using existing F sharp code to do better than task builder. And you can see some performance results there. And uh, oh, there's a whole lot of different, it's maybe a quite a complicated thing for doing task, V task, unit tasks, and so on. Well, this is of interest too. At the moment in F sharp, as we do the feature, you can only write task of T. You can't write any of these other things. Uh, you have to convert away using using other other uh, other things. Uh, and you apply. Okay, fine. Anyway, he's a, a super super knowledgeable about uh, the most uh, extreme details of how async works in .NET. And so, thank you, Nino, for all the conversations we've had about this. Okay, uh, that was another long session. I hope you've all got a lot out of this. It's, I think it's all basically the start of a design review cycle for this kind of work, and we'll uh, we'll do that. I can see Philip on the screen, well, and we'll help make that happen. And uh, thank you all for having it. Fantastic to see the kind of worldwide audience, uh, people from Russia. I know people from a lot of other places as well, and I hope that's been useful and interesting for you. So again, and Vlad, thanks for being my co-conspirator in this in this work. Okay. Thank you, John. Kevin, I noticed another hand up there. Or is that was that from the previous one? That's from that's from the previous one. Okay, good. All right. Thank, um, thank can I ask one more yes, question? Yes, yeah, absolutely, please. So um, assuming we have a, a maybe builder, which is uh, completely synchronous. Will yep. this feature um, help us to well make uh, a completely allocation free code, or yes, is, it still will be a state machine? Like, like, like uh, I mean, will well, this well, feature will help help yeah. us inline the code, like all the code? Uh, so, so, so yes, and in fact, there is an option builder in the um, in the thing. It actually uses a struct. So, in the IL generated, you still get a struct being made on the stack. And you get the code being called, okay. Uh, so, but that is costs basically nothing, uh, okay. And this is exactly what you're asking. It is a maybe builder. It's called option, and here option and v option builders. We reuse the code nicely for the two different things, which is very nice. Uh, we just use option builder base, and this one uses this. It also uses struct, but the end result is a value option. Oh, it just hopes, hosts an option state machine and does value option. That's good. And then you get this kind of thing. And my understanding, this is comparing to a slow option builder. And I don't double check whether those perf results have this or not. Uh, no, I think I was the last time I worked on this code. It was about doing that exact performance test to check that uh, option builder is a say is better than it will be. I'm, I'm absolutely sure it will be better than a slow option builder. Uh, I don't think I jotted down any perf figures, but you can run that test if you like. I'm pretty sure it's a positive test. Um, the just to say, one of the reasons why we don't have an option builder in F -sharp .core was because of this reason. I knew that in the, in my heart of hearts, we should be able to get perfect code out for that. This feature should give us and sh that and should allow us to put in option curly into, uh, into F -sharp .core, and I, then I'll be much happier with, with that becoming a, a normal part of F -sharp practice. It probably will be called option curly just because we don't use the word maybe, even though I kind of like got, got used to maybe, but you know, I think it's better to be option curly. All right, uh, uh, and um, Igor, thank you very much for your 
question and we'll see you all next time and uh thanks again for everyone coming along <laughs>